Okay, continuing on with case one, we're going to talk about thymomas. When you do a chest x-ray and you see a mass, you're going to see a mediastinal mass. There's a differential diagnosis. So you can think of this, like, think of this as the sternum over here, and think of this as the spine, and then you have the heart right here. So what typically happens is you'll take an x-ray and you'll see a mass in the mediastinum area. So then you get the lateral view and you find out if it's in the anterior, the middle, or the posterior. We had an anterior mediastinal mass. So anterior, what's the differential diagnosis? So it's the T's, thymoma, terrible lymphoma, T-cell leukemia, thyroid tumor, or teratoma. Then if you're looking at the, the posterior, 90% are neurogenic. It's almost enough to remember neurogenic, but if you just think about what's in the back, then you could say, okay, maybe a metastasis from theochromocytoma. You could think hernia, neoplasm, as I'm just saying any type of neoplasm, any type of metastases, or a hematoma, because you have so many vessels. You have the descending aorta. You have all of the side branches off the descending aorta. Middle, you're looking at the thoracic aorta, at thoracic aorta, or like an ascending aortic aneurysm, hematomas, uh, neoplasm, which I'm just saying any type of neoplasm, metastasis or otherwise, lymphadenopathy or hernia. So a hernia, anytime, you, and this is coming from our recommended text for x-rays um, for radiology, it says anytime you see a middle mediastinal mass, think hernia. So I don't know why I put it at the bottom, I just did, but hernia should probably be at the top of this list. And so this is going to be what that looks like. This is not the images from our case. In fact, I didn't use any of the images from our case because these uh, videos go, you know, on online and the cases are all copyrighted stuff. So um, this is a middle mediastinal mass. We've lost the silhouette sign from the heart. Got a mass here. So we do this, the lateral. We see, okay, here's the sternum. We got the breast shadow. So we know we're in the anterior mediastinum. Here's where the heart is right here. And then here's posterior mediastinum. So this is where the mass is. And of course, these images aren't from the same person. I'm just giving you example, two examples of uh, thymomas. These are both pictures of thymomas. Okay, so 40 percent, 40% of people who have thymomas are asymptomatic. They're just discovered on chest X-ray. So I'm going to circle 40 because the idea of 40 is going to come up again. Now, on the on the actual symptoms. All of these symptoms, fever, we, you know, except wheezing maybe, the fever, fatigue, weight loss, night sweats, anorexia, these are all symptoms that you see just like in almost any type of cancer tumor or otherwise. These are the symptoms that are saying, hey, there's something going on in the chest. It doesn't specifically say thymoma. So all of these symptoms are very nonspecific. And of course, they're not even really very sensitive because 40% of people are asymptomatic. And so here's the idea. I have my lungs, my lungs, my heart here. Up here I have this tiny little thymus. This is about the size of my thymus. And all of a sudden it grows really big and it's pushing out all of the, the uh, area where my lungs would fill up, all the air is being pushed out, probably pushing on the sternum and causing pressure there. So I'm getting chest pain, I'm getting cough, dyspnea, I'm getting wheezing. Now, 40% have systemic autoimmune diseases. So 40% of people with thymomas have an associated autoimmune disease, and the most strongly associated is myasthenia gravis. 30% of thymomas have, uh, will present with uh, myasthenia gravis, and 15% of people with myasthenia gravis will have a thymoma. And so here's the idea on that. Here's all of the people with myasthenia gravis. Here's all the people with thymoma. So a thymoma I want to say that 30% of it, so if I do like, you know, that's about 30, 33, 66, 100. So 33 to 30%. And I say all of these people have, have all these people that overlap have myasthenia gravis. And then, of course, the myasthenia gravis, it's only like 15%. So it's like there's 15% of the myasthenic people. So it's saying that there's more people that have myasthenia gravis but out of the people that have thymomas, there's a strong association with it. Now, kind of with that visual thing aside, um, the rest of this, there's something called pure red cell aplasia. If you have my, if you have thymoma, then you have a five to eight percent chance of have, of getting a, a coexisting pure red cell aplasia. 
and a 5% chance of getting hypogammaglobulinemia. So whenever you have hypogammaglobulinemia and thymoma at the same time, it's called Goods syndrome. And then there's a very, very, very small percent chance of getting any of the following polymyositis, SLE, thyroiditis, Sjogren's, ulcerative colitis, pernicious anemia, Addison's, stiff person syndrome, scleroderma, panhypopituitaryism, and there's even a few more that I didn't list. So with a thymoma, you actually have to do um, a biopsy. You can't do a fine needle aspiration because you have to look. It requires looking at the architecture, and so a fine needle aspiration can't determine the difference between a thymoma and a lymphoma. Why? Because the thymus is completely full of lymphocytes, and so the differences in a thymoma it's going to be the epithelial tissues, the epithelial cells that are that are hyperplastic. Whereas in a lymphoma, it'll be the lymphoid cells that are hyperplastic. And so the only way to really look at that is by doing a biopsy and not a fine needle aspiration. So here, let's review the normal histology really quickly. So this is the thymus over here, and I've got a dense connective tissue capsule. You'll also notice that it's lobular in, in sh sh uh, shape and structure, and then you have these trabeculae that are going in. You have a dense basophilic uh, cortex and a lighter staining medulla or medulla. Now the second image, you can't quite tell, but this is actually three images right here. So let me cut these apart for you. Now at this initial level of magnif magnification right here, it's really hard to tell what's going on, but just know that most of this is lymphocytes, T lymphocytes. And then you can see like right here, and I'll zoom in for you a little bit, Right here, this would be like an epithelioid, I'm sorry, not an epithelioid, an epithelial cell. Now, typically the books will say that these are supposed to be stellate. I don't really, I can't really ever tell that they're stellate, but those are stellate. They're lighter standing nuclei. I just know that they're a little bit bigger, the lighter standing nuclei and uh, prominent nucleus. And the other thing, whenever you're looking at the thymus and you see clear areas, Typically, clear areas represent areas where there are macrophages, and I'll try to find a really good example. So right here's a clear area, and you see something right in the middle that's probably a, a lymphocyte that got uh, that was um, phagocytized by the macrophage because there's so much lymphocyte. Like if the lymphocyte doesn't get selected for, if it doesn't go through negative and positive selection, it's going gonna, it's gonna to get... Um, phagocytized by the macrophages. It's going to go through, it's going to die, apoptosis and everything. So then down here we have, again, here, here, and here, we have uh, more epithelial uh, cells that make up the architecture of the, of the thymus. And then here we have another macrophage. And then characteristic of the thymus, especially as you go uh, from the cortex down into the medulla, you have these corpuscles that are called thymic corpuscles or sometimes Hassel's corpuscles. And so that makes up most of the normal histology. And here's one more look, except in this part we get to bring out the, the fact that we have capillaries and stuff. So again, we got the capsule at the edge. And then if you if we zoom to the to the left right here, then we're going to see Hassel's corpuscles. So these are some Hassel's corpuscles. And then if we zoom over to the right, then what we're going to see is these capillaries right here. And you can tell there's they're basically the way you see is that there's an empty space and that the empty space has bumps of nuclei poking out, and that means it's a capillary. And so you can see some more right here and here and here and here. And then you see the lymphocytes over to the side, and then down here you can see this epithelial reticular cell. And here in this image, through the staining or whatever, it's a little bit easier to tell that it's stellate in shape. And so, like I've already said, it requires a look at the architecture, but then there's different two different staging things. One's by the World Health Organization, and one's by this uh, this other guy um, named Mas Masaoka, I think, is I'm saying it right, Masaoka. Anyhow, um, most of the books seem to like the Masaoka best, and you can see like stage one is there's you know completely encapsulated, no invasion to the surrounding tissue, and stage two we're still looking at completely encapsulated, but there is invasion, so macroscopic invasion in the surrounding. To, uh, fat, or it doesn't have to be invaded in the surrounding fat, it can be grossly adherent to pleura or pericardium. And so this was the staging of, of our case 
and so there was some adhesion to the pericardium. And so if it would have been more than, so we had adhesion, if it would have been invading into the pericardium, then we would um, stage it as a stage three and stuff. And then, of course, we have disseminated and then uh, hematogenous metastases being the next two stages. And so you can see down here, stage 2B, we're at stage 2, and the 5 and 10 year survival look pretty dang good. And we can also go over and take a look at the World Health Organization, how they classify stuff. And they classify it based on histology. So you can have different types. So you can have a medullary, a mixed, predominantly cortical, cortical, or then you get into like frank sarcomas and stuff that are definitely like pretty bad. But um, so the way I think about this is here's my here's my thymus, right? And then here's my medulla and the higher I go the worse my prognosis gets so in for example medullary uh, thymomas that are primarily medullary you can see right here type A 100% 10 year prognosis and then as I get a little bit of mix I've got medullary and cortical then and it goes down to 90 to 100 then as I get mostly cortical then it drops down even further and then as I get into all cortical it drops down even further and then if I have a thymic carcinoma I'm saying is it differentiated or is it not differentiated differentiated a little bit better prognosis but not really that much and so like I said you can think of this um, as far as that goes you can think of it in, in either of two ways you can think the higher you go the worse you get or you can say the deeper you go the better you get and both of those things uh, work pretty good. And so here's an image of the two types. So here's the medullary and here's the cortical type. And in the medullary, the key feature is that it, it's making swirling patterns. So in my mind, it's almost like it's trying to make giant Hassel's corpuscles, but it's just messing up. That's kind of how I'm thinking of it. And it also kind of looks like maybe two or three hurricanes coming together. And then over here in the cortical type, you can see that it's just a bunch of really, really round cells. It looks They look more spindly over here, spindly. And they look just more round or ovoid over in this, uh, on this side. So cortex, you think that the C, the C is a, a round. So you can think the cortex is round cells. As long as that doesn't get you confused with the whirly shape on this side. I don't know. Just figure out what works best for you. Now, a key clinical thing is that these cortical thymomas give rise to a higher percentage of autoimmune. Um, so I don't know exactly why everybody likes the matza aka or whatever staging system better than the World Health Organization because to me, like, they were both equally predictive of outcomes. Like, one could say the outcome would be this and the other one would do the same thing. But everyone, nobody really liked the cytological type of thing. They liked the more surgical, like how how far did it invade and stuff. But um, the thing that with the with the cytological, these cortical thymomas give rise to a higher percentage of autoimmune. And so in my mind, that's just something that makes the histological feature better than the surgical feature. Okay, etiology, here's the point. Nobody knows. They're like, the books, uh, like I think Harrison's and Robbins, they list like 80 different genes that are like, yeah, maybe this one's associated, maybe that one, maybe this one, maybe that one. Nobody has really found an answer yet. So uh, what they do know is like on mouse chromosome 7, they made a mutation and it's like the model mutation for thymoma studies in mice. Um, but nobody knows really whether or not that mutation corresponds to anything in a human or not. The big thing to know is that um, auto, that you have accompanying diseases and that those accompanying diseases may be able to be treated, like they may go away with a thymectomy. So like we talked about myasthenia gravis earlier, 80% of people with myasthenia gravis have thymic abnormalities. Only 15% of those uh, have actual thymomas. So the thymic abnormalities can be different in everybody and 15% of those are thymomas, meaning 15% of people with myasthenia gravis, not 15% of the 80. Okay, and so patients without a thymoma respond better 
and um, and then and just in general, 65% of patients who get a thymectomy will improve. Their myasthenia gravis will, will go away. With red cell aplasia, thymectomy helps 30%, and then hypogammaglobulinemia, it doesn't get better with a thymectomy. Uh, there's not a lot of uh, illustrative stuff to say. I think that's about all I have for thymomas.